All right, this section is section 3.2, the graph of a function. Now there's 43 questions, so there's quite a few questions, but they move pretty quick. Uh, we'll see that it does. So like, for example, um, we're gonna talk about domain. And domain of a function is all values of input that is legal for the entire equation or the function. Um, right here. You, there's no restrictions on this particular function because there's nothing that you can put in there that would cause a domain problem. And what I mean, for example, let's say that X was in the, where the three was, you know, you can't divide by zero, right? So there is a domain restriction on such functions that are fractions that contain a variable in the denominator that causes a zero to produce. So what you're doing is you're taking and controlling what kinds of values of inputs you're allowed to have in the function. So in this particular case, the function domain is all real numbers, or in the case of writing it as interval notation from negative infinity to positive infinity, because there's no restrictions on this particular function, because you could put whatever value you want in for X. And so we have that. Now, another way of writing this particular function would be to write it like this. And this is what we call a linear function, where it's y equals, or in this case, n of x, because that's a function, all right? So this is the way, another way of writing that function, and therefore, it's allowed to happen, all right? Now, when you look at this, this is also a linear function, and therefore all linear functions, meaning a straight line, that it would be all real numbers. Now, I wanna go ahead and show you that, what that looks like. So let's go ahead and, and show you. So if I put in five X minus eight into my function graph, I go ahead and hit graph, it's going to look like a straight line. That is what linear functions are. They're straight lines, okay? So I want you to get that into your head because all straight lines do not have any restrictions. You can put whatever value you want into there. And if that's the case, you're going to get negative infinity to positive infinity every single time. Likewise is true for also our Quadratic equations, quadratic equations, their functional domains are always going to be the same output value system, not output value system, but same input values, and that is from negative infinity to positive infinity. So you have that, right? Now, when we're looking at question number four, we're looking at radical. Now, when you're looking at radicals, you can't take the function or the radical of a negative value without getting into complex number systems. No real number is produced from a negative quad or radical or square root. So when we take and look at that, we want to set the contents of the radical greater than or equal to zero, okay? Because you can take the value system of, a, uh, of zero for a radical. You can take the square root of zero and it'd be zero. So what you do is you, you then solve for this. So you bring this over to the other side. And so X has to be greater than or equal to negative eight. And that is our answer, right? But that's not an interval notation. So what we wanna do, since it's pointing to the right, we wanna go ahead and set it equal by putting a bracket, negative eight on into infinity, open parenthesis. And that is our answer. And we have, we have it there. So that's pretty simple. All right. Now we go ahead and do the same thing with this next one. Okay. We go ahead and think, well, what can't we put into the denominator? Because remember, fractions, you can't have zeros. So what we want to do and not worry about the negative three, we want to go ahead and set all right, the value of the x squared plus 3, or 13, excuse me, plus 40, we want to set that where 
we want that to not equal zero. So in order to do that, we have to set it equal to zero and throw those answers out basically. All right. So what two numbers multiply together to create 40 that add up to 13. And so we think about it and we're thinking about eight and five. Now that we have that, we now know that where X is equal to negative eight and where X equals negative five, we would have a domain restriction. We would have a problem because this would produce a zero. So we're gonna go ahead and take and jump over these particular numbers. How to do that? So all we do is set coming from negative infinity up to negative eight is smaller than negative five. So we're gonna jump over negative eight and we're not gonna be inclusive to those values. And then we're gonna pick up back at eight and go to five, negative that is. And then we're gonna pick up from negative five and go on to infinity. All right, and that's how we're gonna handle that one. Now that's quite extensive, right? What I have here is, is really long, but it's not complicated. You go ahead and set the denominator equal to zero, and you, you basically factor, find out the two critical values, and then throw them out by just jumping over them. All right. Now, this one's pretty easy. The domain is going to be where it's from, where we got to jump over nine, because nine minus nine is zero, and we can't divide by zero, so we're throwing it out. So all we're going to do is pick up and go ahead and go from negative infinity to nine, and jump over it by doing this and pick it up back at nine and go on to infinity. And that's it. Really is easy, isn't it? Okay. Now, number seven, it says graph, graph of the function of f is given the domain. Now, domain on graphs are reading from left to right. You've got to remember that. Domain is read from left to right. So all I got to do is go ahead and look at the X axis and see that it picks up at negative four and goes on until zero. Now, when we are talking about that, it's not going to be inclusive to the negative four. So it's going to be exclusive. So the way you do that is by putting a parenthesis, negative four on to zero inclusive because there is a hard dot there. There's a closed dot. So that's the answer we're looking for here, okay? Now, number eight, all right? We're gonna go from, we're talking about the domain. Now, domain is left, right again from left to right. It's going on forever to the left. So we're going to go ahead and pick it up from negative infinity. Oh, whoops, I closed it off already. <laughs> And we're going to go ahead and continue all the way up until we get to two. But then the two is exclusive, not inclusive. So that's the, that's the domain that we're going to look at. Okay, that's exactly what they have there. Now the range. Range is looking at things from to bottom to top. So we're looking at range from bottom to top. So we, we look at it like this. So... When we're looking at the range, it starts at negative five. So we're going to be inclusive to that value because we're looking at the negative five from here, this right here. So negative five inclusive, and it goes on up until you go to here on the graph here. But what about this arrow? What does this arrow mean? Wait a second. This arrow means it goes on forever up. So that means it's going on until infinity. All right, for the range. And that's our answer. See, a negative five onto infinity. See, so some people would go ahead and put from negative five up to four and get it wrong because they forgot about the arrow. Okay, and what that means. Got to be careful. And so we have our answer. So we're almost done with the first 10 questions. While there's 43 questions, that's or 47, whatever it is, that's quite extensive. It moves pretty fast. Now we're looking at the y-intercept. The y-intercept is where you're crossing over the y-axis. So we're looking at three, all right? 
x-intercept is at negative 3, negative 1. The domain on all quadratics or U-shaped like looking figures called parabolas, it's going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then when it's an upward bound parabola, it's going to start at negative 1 on into infinity. And mind you, it's inclusive. So it starts here. Remembering you're reading it from uh, bottom to top since the range goes up and down. All right, you're looking at bottom to top and domain, by the way, you look from left to right. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and be answering these questions. So let's take a look at that again. So the y intercept is at five. The x intercept, there isn't any, so it's going to be DNE, does not exist. And it tells you right there, DNE. Does not exist because it doesn't cross over the x-axis anywhere. The domain for absolute value, because that's what this is, is a V-shaped like look configure, is from negative to positive infinity, just like the uh, quadratic. All right. And then the range, it goes from four on to infinity. And then we look at uh, the input value of negative one is going to have an output value of six. So all we do is go from negative one up to six or up to the line, and then it shows six. And then at the value of two as the input, it's gonna also go up to five. So we're looking at five. All right, at first I thought I was gonna go back to six, but it's not. All right, now let's take a look at this one, domain. It's from inclusive negative two to one. All right, exclusive because it's a uh, open dot. Range is going to go from zero, from zero up to four. And then the x intercept is going to be at negative two, the y intercept is at four. And then that's it. That's the answer. This moves quick. All right, domain, this one, domain is going from one exclusive onto infinity. Range is going from three exclusive on to infinity. And that's what when I say that what I'm saying is I'm writing it as well right here because there's no writing necessary for this particular operation. So the x intercept there is DNA because it doesn't cross over anything, as well as the y intercept doesn't cross over anything. So DNA for both of them. The input value for two is going to be four. Input value for five is going to be five. This is moving very, very quick. I hope I'm not moving too quick, but as I said, these move fast. Um, domain from negative, what is that, negative two to five. And both notice how both of them are inclusive. The range is going from negative one to positive six. X intercept. Is crossing over at negative one. For the y-intercept, it's crossing over at one. For the input value of negative one, it's zero. And for the input value of three, it's going to be four. These move fast. If, if these are confusing you, you're overthinking it. The domain for these kinds of graphs, which this is an exponential uh, decay function, okay, then this is always going to be for the domain from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now the range value, this has what's called a horizontal asymptote, is going to be where that dashed line is, all right, so the range is going to be from a positive one, but exclusive. It's not. It's going to ride along it. It's not going to be equal to it. So it's going to be from positive one on to infinity. It goes up forever. See how the what I'm just saying is now written here. The x-intercept. It doesn't have any x-intercepts. So DNA. And the y-intercept is going to be at two. The function of negative one, we gotta go to negative one here and go up and see that it's five.
The domain for this is from negative infinity to positive infinity. The range, it goes from negative infinity all the way up to negative one inclusive. See the inclusive bar? The x-intercept, there are none, so DNE. Y-intercept is negative one. Process for negative four is gonna be negative three. And for the input value of three, it's going to be at negative one. Man, I'm flying through these now. I'm hoping that you're keeping up. Now, where the function is increasing is a matter of just seeing that it increases when you're going up some kind of form like this, and it's decreasing when you're going like this. Just you're reading from left to right. So on this one, it's increasing from the value of one negative one and a half all the way to one and a half that's when it's increasing so 1.5 to 1.5 one being of course negative so negative 1.5 to positive 1.5 where it's decreasing is from negative infinity all the way to negative 1.5 and then it picks up at value of 1.5 down to infinity now I say down to infinity, but while it's going down, it's going down as well as it's going over. So we have to think about it in terms of that. All right. So because we're looking at the domain and not the range. So we don't care about it. it's going down, but we know it's going on forever that direction as well. Now the function is constant at no point in time because constant means it's a flat line. So D and E. All right, now the function's increasing from negative infinity, okay, from negative infinity all the way up to um, three, inclusive. All right, it's never decreasing, so that's DNE. The function's never constant, so it's DNE there as well. All right, very quick for increasing, decreasing. So function's increasing, the entire point of this, so from negative infinity to positive infinity. The function is never decreasing and it's never staying constant. So even though some people would want to be uh, misconceived by thinking it's constant at this point in time, it if you focused in on it, it's going to be just slightly going up more at that point. And once it even hits that negative six, it's still going up, but it never is going down, okay? Now the function's increasing from exclusive from negative five to exclusive two. So exclusive means we don't, we have parentheses when I say the word exclusive. It's DNA for decreasing and DNA for constant. For this one, from increasing negative infinity all the way up to four. And then the function is increasing at the interval, or excuse me, decreasing at never, DNA. And the function stays constant from four on to infinity. So the function is increasing from negative six to four, and then also from negative two to infinity. Decreasing from negative infinity to negative six, and then from negative four to negative two. The function remains constant, never. And that's why DNA. All right, now we're looking at relative maximum and relative minimum and such. So the x value at which the function is meeting its max is, we're looking at relative because it's localized. Now, yes, while there's maximum value up here and stuff like that, we're not focusing attention to that. So we need to focus on this area, okay? So if we were to draw a box, it would be around this boxed area right here. So that occurs at when the value of input is three. Now, what's the relative maximum or maxima? is when the output is going to be equal to one. So that's the answer for what we need there. Now, what is the relative minimum? 
the relative minimum is going to be at where x equals 5, and that's going to be occurring at 0. Okay, so 5 is the input value, and, it's, and the relative minimum is 0. So kind of get that in your head of how that works. So then we're looking at the x value, which the function of the relative maximum would be at negative 8, as well as, or, well, excuse me, not relative, not, the function input would be 4, and then 8. And then the output values of what that would mean is both at negative 8. OK? So all you're doing is find the top of the hill. Bottom of the hill is minimum. So we're looking at that occurring at 6. And the value of output for when that happens is negative 9. All right, I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm going to allow you to have the opportunity to experience that. I've done a lot already, so it's just a matter of you doing it. I think you can figure out relative maximum minimum uh, just by looking at it. Okay, so I'll let you guys take a look at it. Now for symmetry. Now. It's going to have symmetry with respect to the x-axis, all right? Now, I like to look at this in respects to even or odd. But now, a lot of times, it's just easier just to graph the darn thing. There's a couple of different approaches that you can make towards understanding this. However, just graphing it helps. Now, the thing is, is by graphing it, though, you'd have to go ahead and have to put this on to, um, you know, figuring out what it equals. So in other words, you've got to get y by itself, okay? So in order to get y by itself, we have to go ahead and do this. Um, that would be negative, negative two. All right, and we have, in order to kill the square, you have to take square root, and you get this. So in order to put that into the graphing calculator, I'm going to do it now. I have to put in as two different problems. All right, I have to put in the square root of x minus 2, and then negative x minus 2. And then go ahead and hit graph. Now, it looks like and it is two separate equations, but as a function, it's not even a function. But does it have symmetry though? And symmetry is a fold line, basically. I mean, so I can fold this upon the x axis, okay? So then this is symmetrical to the x axis, okay? And that's what we're looking for. So symmetry with respect to the x axis. And it's helpful to have this graph, but anytime you have a perfectly drawn out line where this is, uh, or well, this where this is squared and stuff, most likely it's going to be where there's no other y squared and stuff. But anyway, you're going to have something that looks like this. But always get y by itself and then be able to graph it. So this one, if we go ahead and try to get this by itself, um, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, or show you how to do that. We want to get y by itself. So what I'm going to do is flip things around a little bit, make it where the y to the third is positive, and then make it where we have x squared plus 6. Okay. And then I want to take the cubic root of this. All right. Now, by taking the cubic root, that will get this out of there. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. Clear, clear. And I'm just going to go ahead and put the cubic root. Now I'll hit math. Cubic root is right here. And then I'm going to go ahead and hit x squared, because that's what we got here. So x squared, and then plus 6.
pick rep. Okay, now look at that. And by looking at that, it looks like it's symmetrical to the y axis. So that's the answer we're looking for. Now, oftentimes you're not going to be able to see that by just your naked eye and by looking at things like this. So you have to just go ahead and isolate the y and then put it in your graph calculator and see what it looks like. Easy process as long as you follow through. Okay, and do what I said. Now, this is symmetrical to all things, x, y, and the origin. Okay, now y. If you go ahead and get, it's a circle, by the way. We've already looked at it once before, but now I didn't ever graph it for you. What you gotta do is go ahead and get y by itself. And the way to do that is put, by taking the square root of y squared and then having this as your input value. All right, this is what you're gonna end up having. So now, um, what we have here is delete this. We have the positive value of that. So I'm gonna hit second radical, then negative x squared and plus two. Now I'm gonna have a negative of radical negative x squared and then plus two and then we have graph okay look at that um sorry it was off the screen I had to punch it all in okay now i'm going to go ahead i can zoom in on this if i wanted to just hit zoom uh let's see zoom in too and it looks like a circle, doesn't it? Okay, it looks like almost an oval. But let me let me go ahead and autofocus that so you can really see it. Okay, it looks like that, doesn't it? All right. Now this is when you what you punch into the system. So this looks really like a circle. So it's symmetrical. All right, and it is in fact a circle. It's very symmetrical to what you're um, you're seeing from the origin, so you can you can go ahead and uh, fold it on the x-axis. You can fold it on the y-axis. As a matter of fact, fold on both the x and the y, and that would be symmetrical to the origin. So they're all of them at the same exact time. All right, all circles, by the way, do that. And it, what what is making this a circle is when you're squaring the x and squaring the y at the same time. Okay, that's what's gonna cause the circle to happen. Now, if, if it's symmetrical, okay, if it's symmetrical to the x-axis, then it folds upon the x-axis. Now, let's go ahead and determine, okay, this is foldable on the y-axis. Now, if it's foldable on the y-axis, okay, it's even if it's foldable on the origin okay it's odd and origin means you could fold it on the x and the y in or, and then one branch of the function will land upon itself now this one would be neither because you can't do that okay because you can't fold this on the x and it land on to the itself and fold it over the y so this would be the case of neither. Now, so you're looking at that. And now if you determine the function below is even or odd or neither, you're going to go ahead and determine whether it's reflecting over the y or, or reflecting over the x-axis. Okay. Now, if you look at this input, it's negative 2, negative 6, negative 10, 0, and then you've got positive 10. Neg uh, 6, 2. And then we're looking at 2, 7, negative 2, 2, negative 7, 2, negative 2. Now, the, if this was reflective over the y axis, then it would be a parabola, but this is not. Okay. So this one's going to be where it's odd. Okay. Because it's not reflecting over the x axis, it's reflecting over the x and the y axis. So these, what you could do is take these coordinate points 
and see where they are in respects to the graph. So we're going to go ahead and graph them. So create a graph. All right. And then you go ahead and say negative two is here. And then say input is right here, or output, excuse me. And then negative six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the output seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you're going to go ahead and go to negative 10. So this is six, uh, seven, eight, nine, 10. I'll put negative two, one, two. So we're looking at a graph that looks like this. All right, if I were to continue it. <laughs> but let me go ahead and not even put it like that. Now, we got the value of input of 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Output is positive two. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and put in the value of, let me, I, I got to keep trying. All right. That value of input is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Output seven. One, two, three, four five, six, seven. And then I'm going to go ahead and do two, one, two, negative two. So it looks like this. Okay. Now I'm going to just continue to connect these. Now look at this. I go ahead and if I were to bend this over to it uh, on, on the X axis and then bend it on the, or fold it, I should say, on the y-axis, this piece would land on this piece. All right, that's how that works. All right, this piece will land on this piece. Okay, always graphing it gives us an idea about what it looks like and what we can determine of the odd or even. Because remember, if it folds onto, you know, this way, as well as this way, like a piece of paper, then it's going to go ahead and land on itself. It's a function that's is odd. All right. And it you know the indication that the function is symmetric with respect to the origin. All right, that's what we're looking at. All right, this question didn't ask for that. All right, now determine whether the graph of the function is even, odd, or neither. It's reflectable over the y-axis, so it's even. And it reflects over the y-axis. Now, determine whether the function's odd, even, or neither. And this is reflectable over the y-axis, so even. Origin, if I flip this over and then uh, fold it over here, it would land upon itself, therefore, odd. You can't fold this where it lands upon itself at the origin, so therefore, this is neither. Now, a quick way to determine whether it's odd, even, or neither from this is by simply looking at the powers. It's not the, anything to do with the leading coefficients. It's all about the powers of the exponents. If these are both even, then the entire function is even. And now in this case right here, when we're looking at something like this, okay, the function right here is squared, and you'd want to think that it's going to give you a resulting value of even. And but watch what happens when we foil this out, it gives us this. And when that case happens, we have an even and an odd and therefore neither. All right. And in the next case, you have x the first power, x to the third, 
this is odd and this is odd. Whenever both of those are odd, then you're going to get odd as your answer. All right, a kind of a trick. So now identify the function. This is a quadratic, it's even. All right, I'm just going to select this. It's even. Absolute value is even. Origin, because it can reflect over. So odd. Now this one doesn't, a linear function can, doesn't have to go through the, the origin. Therefore, this one is neither. This one's reflectable over the y and the x. So therefore, it's odd. And then this one, it can fold upon itself anywhere, you know, on the y-axis. So that's even. Cubic function is resulting odd. And the square root function is neither because it doesn't fold upon itself at any point. But whereas this does, the cubic root function, it folds on the x and the y, and therefore this one's odd. Now the graph of the functions given below used to determine the, the following characteristics. The domain goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. The range goes from four on to infinity. The x intercept is there is none. And the, and the range, all right, or the y intercept, excuse me is occurring at eight. Open interval of which the function is increasing goes from negative two on infinity. And where it's decreasing is from negative three to negative two. Where it's constant is from negative infinity up to three. And if, oh, that should be negative three if I didn't say neg negative. I mean, you, you can see where it is, negative three. It's like I said three, but any x value for which the, you know, f had a relative minimum would be at the value of input negative two. And the value of any relative minimum is four. any value or x value which the, has the relative maximum we're looking at the value any x value for the relative maximum this doesn't have a The input value or the output value is four. What is the input value? So look for four and it's going to be negative two because we're coming up to the input value or output value, excuse me, of four and seeing what input value would create that. So that'd be negative two. All right, I'm going to come down. And then is F even odd or neither? And this would be neither because it doesn't land upon itself when folding. All right, so there's a lot of pieces and a lot of information that goes on to each and every one of these questions, okay? You just got to be patient with it. I mean, domain goes from negative infinity all the way up to nine. Range goes from negative infinity all the way up to two. Inclusive, by the way. 
x-intercept is happening at 1 and 9. All right, 1 and 9. An open interval, which increases, is from negative infinity all the way up to 5. And then decreasing is from 5 on to 9. Open interval for the, you know, the constant. There isn't any, so it's DNA. Open interval for which the function is greater than zero. So where is the function greater than zero? So when we're looking at that, the output, the input value is the, the uh, I should say the value of which the output value is zero is the x-axis. So where is it greater is from negative or it's going to be positive 1 to 9. That's where it's greater than 0. Um, oh, this is less than. I don't know how to read. <laughs> it says less than 0, so it's going to be from negative infinity all the way to 1. All right, negative infinity to 1. And then it's greater than is going to be the one I was trying to emphasize before, which is from 1 to 9. So this is less than, this is greater than getting a little tired after doing a couple of these lessons. So my mind is starting to shut down. So uh, any X value for which the relative maximum, there's uh, going to be one maximum. It's going to be at input value five and output value two. Um, no, there is no minimums, by the way, no minimum for that. It's maximum. I'm looking for maximum. So this one's the five two answer. So minimum, there isn't any. This is maximum. Okay, now input value negative three. So negative three is going to be output value negative six. Now the x values for which the output is two. So output two is going to be five because there it is. And then is it even or odd or neither? So this one's neither. Now to graph a function, a piecewise function, the way you do this is you go ahead and take your graph, all right, and look at it where it says x is less than zero it's going to be this function. So this is a decreasing function, it's negative one, and it starts at negative one. So what I do is go here, make it, all right. I can go ahead and do that, but now I want, I can go ahead and do that, but that's not the right kind of function I need. So I need to clear all that. I need it to go from here to here. Now I need to make sure that I'm going up or going down one over one. So that's from here to here, okay? I need it to be that way. Now, this is an open circle at this value. All right, because it's not inclusive to there. So you have to make sure you indicate that. Now, from this one, from when x is greater than or equal to 0, it's going to be this function. So I'm going to go ahead and pick it up at 3 and go up to over 1. And I'm going to go ahead and put a closed circle at this end value and that is what we're looking for for that answer okay and now the range of this value system the range would be from exclusive of negative one to infinity okay so negative one exclusive is not equal to it all the way into infinity now just because it's a jump here doesn't mean anything it, this line continues to go on forever anyway no jump or anything. Now the input value of negative one is right here. It's going to be zero for the output. There it is. The graph of which I just created was in fact what I created here. I had to show you how to do a piecewise function. Okay. Now this is indicating to you if you have constants, 
how to type in interval notation. See the brackets and stuff like that? Now, something similar to what we had right here is to enter such solutions, type in this, okay? Now, this is where you're gonna get the range value. You have to be careful with the range value of this one because it's a particular value system. It looks like this when you graph it, okay? From whenever you have from the value of three, anything less than it's six. So you're gonna go ahead and go from three. I'm gonna make sure I pick this one from three. It's gonna go like that. And of course it's exclusive to that value system. So you're gonna go ahead and put an open circle at this. And then you go ahead and follow the next one. And you go ahead and graph that. You're gonna to go to negative one, or excuse me, positive five. And then it's going down one. So I'm gonna go down one all the way here till I get here. And then I'm gonna go to continue to go down one over one. And then I'm gonna put a closed circle at this right here. So that is what's happening over here and why it's all happening. So you need to make sure you see that, okay? Now, once you go ahead and um, recognize what the range value is, the range value you're talking about from negative infinity all the way up to two, but then there is, this doesn't continue, so it breaks here. So that's why you have to unionize it with the value system of six, but it's, it's a constant at six, and it doesn't go up forever. All right, anymore. So it's constant six. So that's when you put it in this way, where the six comma six. All right, and then you have your own. And make sure you put not parentheses, but brackets. And that's, it's explained right here, by the way. It's explained right into the problem set. I'm going to let you guys have this. All right, this has, I'm going to show you the answer, but all right. The range is from negative infinity to positive infinity. The output value is negative two. And the graph looks like this. All right. So now you can take a look at it. And here, this one. All right. It's asking you, all right, to identify that. And here's the answer. And you can actually. You can look up how to graph piecewise functions, by the way. Look it up on the internet and put it in your graphing calculator. There's no, there's no shame in that. Yep, you can use your graphing calculator. Just literally type in, all right, how to enter a piecewise function in Desmos uh, we don't want it on Desmos, all right? So we just want to go ahead and put it into a graphing calculator on a graphing calculator, on, you know, into a graphing calculator. And you want it for the TI-84, right? So how to graph piecewise functions on a TI-84, and they, they'd show you how to walk you through that, okay? And I'll, I'll let you explore. You can go ahead and do videos and such. So there are all kinds of ways you can learn. So figure it out, but that's the way to do it. All right. And likewise, they have multiple um, piecewise functions for you to process. All right, I'm gonna let you guys figure these out, the rest of this, and then I'll let you, uh, I'll call this video a uh, you know, conclusion. All right, finish that one.